all yours. All right. Um, so um, my name is Daniel. I'm a senior software engineer on the Pulp team. And my topic today is observability and the Open Telemetry project. Um, and just an FYI, so I kind of changed my topic um, a little bit uh, a day or two ago. So there, if there are any areas in this presentation that like aren't quite polished enough or um, you need more clarification, just please just feel free to ask questions. Um, and Let's get started. Um, so what is observability? Um, so in production, uh, complex infrastructure, which can mean both hardware and software, is kind of like a black box. Um, when things start to go wrong, you need to know early, and you want to be able to find the relevant information to pinpoint the issue quickly so that you can resolve it and hopefully not have a, uh, a lot of downtime, or maybe avoid downtime entirely. So observability is basically trying to understand a system from the outside, um, basically by letting us ask questions about the system without knowing what's going on in the inner workings. Um, we can easily troubleshoot and handle novel problems. Things you don't know in advance might become a problem. And it can try and help you answer the question, why is this happening? So this is a quote from Mikey Dickerson. Um, if you don't know who this is, this is one of the people who worked at Google who was brought in to help fix healthcare.gov. Healthcare.gov about a decade ago was a big national project to have a, a basically a national exchange for health insurance. And the initial rollout was something of a disaster. Um, it, it did not go well. And this quote from him is, um, there was no monitoring, there is no dashboard, there is nothing, there is no place to look to see if the site was working tonight, today or not, except for CNN. Uh, don't do that. Have monitoring. You know, hopefully um, you won't find out that your site is broken on CNN, but um, the principle still applies. And, and maybe you do find out on CNN. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the three pillars of observability are metrics, logs, and traces. Um, metrics are numeric representations of data that's measured over intervals of time. Um, the great thing about metrics is they're easy to visualize, uh, easy to correlate together with each other, uh, efficient to generate, uh, collect, and store. Um, so if you think about it, like logs scale with um, activity. So the more the more requests you're getting, the more logging you have. It scale. It's a linear relationship. Um, so that means that as the load on your website increases, the load of the logging also increases, and the load of analyzing those logs in real time also increases. And so there, there are some scalability aspects of logs that are not ideal. Um, examples of metrics are requests per second, failures per second, megabits per second, resource utilization, like CPU and RAM, um, number of active logins, uh, rolling average of request latency, and maybe you break that out into a histogram, or maybe you list that out as you know, P95 latency, P99 latency. Um, there's all sorts of different examples, and you can probably think of more pretty easily. Uh, so logs probably don't require too much explanation. Um, logs are basically an immutable time-stamped record of discrete events that happened over time. Uh, logs are great, but 
you can have too much of a good thing. If you start running into failures in production, if all you have is lugs, it's very difficult to piece together the failure, especially in real time. Um, maybe in your post-mortem, uh, logs can be a very valuable way to figure out exactly what happened, but trying to trying to figure out what's happening in real time from logs is uh, very difficult, and they don't provide much context. Um, so traces. Uh, traces are an end-to-end -end detailed construction of an entire action, um, which can sometimes cross service boundaries. So action here uh, usually means a user request. So if I have a, <coughs> a large uh, service um, constructed perhaps of microservices, uh, or, or at least more than one service, my user request to the initial outer layer of this um, of this service um, begins a trace, and in in all of the events that this kicks off are considered together in a trace. And so, if you look at this picture, what you can see is there are different ser uh, services and in, in different colors. Um, there's a parent-child relationship between the um, the services at the top, or the or the actions at the top and the actions below, and you can see how this cascades through different um, API calls, through different services, and you can see um, how long each specific step is taking, and this is all part of this one user action. Uh, so traces versus logs. Uh, traces are a bit like logs on steroid, uh, steroids. Um, you can <coughs> uh, basically include lots of context about significant steps during the processing of the request, including potentially hops against different services or across different services. Uh, there is a lot more structure available than logs, and you can even represent them as logs, um, which you can see here. But because you have more structure available, you can do interesting things. Um, so you can see this is basically a bunch of log messages constructed from a trace, and um, it's it's basically a textual representation of the same thing we saw on the other slide. So a point, it's much easier to go from a structured collection of correlated events, which is a trace, to flat uncorrelated logs than it is to go from uncorrelated log events to a trace or some kind of picture of what happened. Um, thus, sometimes the logging functionality provided by a tracing library uh, can be preferable because you can do it both ways. So tracing versus profiling. Uh, profiling is a concept that I think most developers are probably familiar with. Um, Profiling is basically a way of automatically instrumenting a program so that you can measure the performance in a fine-grained way, often down to individual lines or functions. And the difference between tracing and profiling is uh, tracing is aware of request and response cycles. Uh, instead of being fully automatic, uh, it's it's us that are adding the information to the code ourselves and annotating it with context. And tracing can also track parameters. Um, so to dig into this a little bit more, um, if you were to profile a web server process, all you would see is where it's spending 
most of its time aggregated across all the requests in the loop, um, like all the requests being handled. It's not going to tell you what's taking the most time in this request or in that request, or, or does this parameter cause it to take longer for some reason because it goes through a different code path? Um, so profiling is is kind of like it's it's aggregated across the whole runtime of the program, uh, rather than kind of um, oriented towards a, a specific action, spe specific user action. Um, so what is open telemetry? Uh, so this is the de the definition straight from the website. Um, open telemetry is a collection of tools, APIs, and SDKs for instrumenting, generating, collecting, and exporting telemetry data, metrics, logs, and traces uh, to help you analyze your software's performance and behavior. So quick note, um, we talk a lot about telemetry, at least we have this week, and Brian is, Brian's next talk uh, will be about telemetry, but the telemetry in open telemetry is not the same as what we have been referring to as telemetry. Um, so this is not um, automated. Oops, I typoed. Um, so this is not automated uh, usage feedback uh, provided to developers. This is kind of more like a user monitoring their application and what's going on and how it's how smoothly it's running um, if there are problems and so on uh, so the, there's not that much overlap i just want to make that clear um, it's it's a different thing um, so open telemetry is an emerging standard um, it's part of the C cncf um, foundation <laughs> atm machine uh, the you know the cncf organization um, the same organization that's behind uh, Kubernetes. Um, open telemetry is very rapidly becoming a, the standard set of libraries across many programming languages that you use to get this functionality. Um, the ecosystem is pretty much consolidating around open telemetry. Um, so supported languages. Um, Python, Ruby, C++, Go, .NET, Java, JavaScript, Rust, Swift, PHP, Erlang. Uh, that pretty much covers most of what you would use in um, web development. And it is the second most active CNCF project behind Kubernetes. Uh, so this is, it, it's a pretty significant thing. It's not, um, it is pretty much becoming a standard. <laughs> um, why open telemetry? So applications are getting more distributed. Um, many applications, including Pulp, are spread, another typo, whoops, uh, are spread across multiple services, even if they are not architected as microservices per se. Uh, so I, I probably wouldn't call Pulp a microservice application per se, but there's still multiple services. And even monolithic applications, like completely monolithic applications, are still often reliant on services um, such as a database or Redis cache, et cetera. And um, the performance of these components is just as relevant to the application performance as you know, some, some other you know, user developer uh, some other service that the, the developer has written themselves. Um, so monitoring a distributed application presents very unique and difficult challenges. And the ecosystem strongly benefits from the network effects of having standards. Um, the consolidation around open telemetry means that collection backends and their tools can be swapped without needing to completely re-implement or re-instrument your code using entirely new libraries. So this is a big deal. Um, even, even a year or two ago, uh, the norm was pretty much 
you would, if you want to use some tool, um, you would have to use the client libraries that came along with that tool. And if you want to swap tools, you'd have to swap client libraries. And open telemetry pretty much changes that. Um, a lot of the vendors that are that like have been developing their tools have actually been uh, deprecating their own client libraries specifically in favor of open telemetry. Um, so uh, the ability to be vendor agnostic uh, is is a big deal. Uh, and the benefits are enough that you know even the vendors themselves recognize this. Um, so open telemetry became the standard tool set for tracing uh, pretty early on uh, years ago. Um, it, and it's kind of expanding from there to metrics and logs. Um, I will say uh, the metrics and log support is less mature um, than tracing. Um, but it's it's pretty much being adopted anyway. Um, so there's there's a lot it, it it really is standardizing around open telemetry and, and the project itself a lot. So components of open telemetry, um, which also is, is frequently abbreviated as OTEL. Um, there's API, uh, S SDK, and the collector. Uh, so the API is, there is a distinction. Uh, the API is in charge of uh, gathering telemetry and all the data that's part of it. Um, and this is kind of user, user instrumentation. Um, so you have to add this to your code. Uh, the SDK. Um, user instrumentation. You mean the, for in our example with Pulp, it would be administrators of Pulp would be using the API? Or is it developers uh, using it? A developer is using the API to add instrument instrumentation to their code. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so it, it's for adding instrumentation. The SDK, on the other hand, um, this the distinction that, that they give is that um, basically it's what gets the data out of the current process into another entity for analysis. Um, so there's the API that basically acts as the interface between our code and open telemetry. You know, it, it passes information along. But like actually gathering all that data and aggregating it and so on and so forth is kind of hidden away. Um, you have control over it, like you can you can tell it how it should be handled, but it it mostly just happens in the background, and you don't have to think about it too much. What do you mean <clears throat> it happens in the background? Um, something like initiates the collection of data, right? Like, mm -hmm. is the SDK like installed as part of an application that collects data? So how, how to describe this? So like, can you give a concrete example? Yes, 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 yes. Um, so let's say I have, I have some application code. Uh, let's say I have a counter for the number of requests that have been processed. Every time a new request happens, I update the counter. Mm -hmm. But uh, that information is like the counter, the value of the counter is still in process. And actually what this really is, is is in some sense, is an event stream. It's not so much I'm updating an integer as this, um, this particular span is updating this integer. It's, it's an event. And so these events um, are published. Uh, so the SDK basically handles the logic around do how, how it's distributed. So like, um, you don't, you don't want to be sending network requests 
for every single update of the request counter. Mm -hmm. and I mean so, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand that. I'm, and the request counter, is it really being um, uh, governed by the SDK? Like, what? Where there is some place where the counter is actually being stored, right? Like, yeah, it, it, it's, that, it's 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 basically so it's it's being this is being handled by the SDK. So um, depending on how you want to move the data out of the process to some other place for analysis, there's different, there's different, um, some tools are push-based and some, to, some tools are push-based, or sorry, pull. some pull-based. <laughs> and um, for example, with Prometheus, mm -hmm. uh, you're basically expected to uh, lazily provide this information when some external service initiates a request for it. Whereas with push with push based, you're expected to, you know, on some cadence, provide this information um, eagerly, you know, push it out to some other um, service. And in both cases, um, you don't want to provide the entire event stream because you're you're just it would it would just be it it would be a lot of network traffic and it would not mm -hmm. be performant. Um and so the SDK is is basically handling, you know, one, it's handling the pushing or the pulling, right? Mm -hmm. Um so setting up setting up the actual process of exporting it is kind of you can figure it, but you don't have to manage it. Yeah. And and for another thing, uh, the SDK is is handling, um, basically collapsing all this event stream down into you know the minimum amount that it it needs to send over. Um. So instead of so instead of sending you know five hundred um, counter updates, it sends you know, one counter update uh, from, you know, the number one to the number 500 mm -hmm. uh, every, you know, mm -hmm. five seconds. Yeah. So that all makes sense to me. And so here's my quick summary of that. You use the API to expose some metrics in your application, and then you run the SDK as a separate process, I guess, that's collecting it? No. Or is it... So the, S the SDK is just is just kind of running in the background of your process. Okay. So like the code is just there. It's all, yeah, yeah, so it is all one process. Okay, cool. Yes, it, it, it's it's probably in a different thread. I don't know about like- Yeah, yeah, uh, no, I understand that. But I, don't, I don't know the specifics of how it's implemented, but it, it, it's, it's there in your process. Okay. It's running as part of your code. Cool. Um, so uh, Daniel, if we just before we move on, similarly to what Dennis did, I'm going to repeat what I think I heard, and like you did for Dennis, you can you can correct me when I go off the rails. So I am a pulp developer. I'm a I'm a pulp RPM plugin writer. It's my responsibility to write using the Open Telemetry API the instrumentation for pulp RPM for the kinds of things that we want to expose to. Uh, telemetry collection or to write traces. I put that code directly into our into the code I'm writing. There, the SDK is running as part of. We brought up pulp with the pulp RPM plugin, and part of that process is going to embed the SDK executing. Is yes. that correct? Okay, good. That's that cool. Correct. I had that wrong until you corrected Dennis. So I'm learning. Yay. Yeah. So that, the SDK is right. I don't have to write the SDK as a plugin developer. It and we don't have to write the SDK. We just have to make sure that it's up and running and available because the pulp instance is now up and running <laughs> at an installation at some community that's you know is using using it in their production systems. And they're using, say, uh, I don't know, Grafana or some big tool for visualizing what's going on in their system. And that tool is going to be talking to the SDK to gather the information and then do whatever it is they're going to be doing with it. That, that, that's a collector. 
is that is the last piece is that correct P pretty much yeah okay so so let me rephrase uh this is correct that's correct as i understand it um yeah. you know granted i've i've been doing all this research for the past you know two days um but you know that is that's my understanding um <clears throat> Uh, so just to give a, a real quick, a, a very specific example is, you know, let's say you have a, a push-based um, exporter. You want, it, you know, you want the data be, to be exported every five seconds um, to this other collector. Uh, I, as a plugin writer, or as as a software developer, do not need to actively every five seconds tell it to send the data the sdk is is basically i can figure it to send it every five seconds and it just happens in the background outstanding cool um and and, and you tell it you tell it how to export it um and so you know you can you can send it over um you know the open telemetry protocol which is odlp or uh or it can have it set up a prometheus um endpoint so there's different ways you can do it. Mm -hmm. um, you can have exported. It's very pluggable. Um, but um, for the most part, you're just configuring it, and you're not writing code that like actively does anything. And if I decide, sense. if I decide that how I want it to be collected is going to change, I don't have to change the code, the API using code. the The instrumentation stays the same even yes. if I'm changing what the SDK is doing. So I don't have to go in and change my code. I just reconfigure my SDK somewhat differently and we're off to the races. Yeah, that, that's okay. my understanding. Okay, cool. All right, uh, moving on. Um, so the collector uh, receives telemetry data, processes telemetry data, exports telemetry data. Um, I, I'm sorry, this is, you can't see the lines. Um, it doesn't show up on black but um they're, they're these bo you know they're, the, the boxes are all you know there's an arrow from each box to into this receive and then it's an air, arrow from export into each of these boxes um apologies for that not being visible we, we can see it okay um um i'm sorry i'm quoting because i ripped this language from you know another website which i linked probably from there um, so why choose the hotel collector when you can send data directly to Jaeger or Prometheus or, or the console or something? And it's pretty much because of flexibility. Um, you can have it sent multiple places. Uh, you can have it processed by stripping attributes or handling batching, et cetera, before sending it to uh, some other place. Um, basically to reduce network traffic, kind of like I was saying, uh, or or for security reasons, maybe you maybe you want to to log something, or maybe you want some information to be available in in some places you're exporting it to, and not to others, um, and so on. Uh, and it's decouple the producer from the consumer. Um, so last year I did a talk on Prometheus. How is this different? Um, so Prometheus is a, a, a time series metrics monitoring tool. Um, it comes with like data storage and some analytics built in. Open telemetry is not that. Um, it's a, a vendor agnostic set of specifications and libraries. Um, it doesn't do analytics. It doesn't do storage. You need to choose a backend for that. But you can choose pretty much any backend, including Prometheus, because uh, because it's all standardized, because it's being adopted as it's kind of like the standard. Um, back to metrics. Um, metrics are usually about aggregating data. Um, you have some large number of measurements, and you want to be combined and summarized, and reduced into uh, statistics about those metrics events. Um, probably taking place in a certain time window. Um, <clears throat> so common aggregations are sum, count, average, histogram. Um, and so here's some specific examples. 
So a counter is a value that's summed over time. Uh, you can think of it like an odometer. It only ever goes up. Uh, a measure is a value that's aggregated over time. It's more like a trip odometer. Um, it represents a value over some defined range. Like a trip odometer on a car, you know, you can reset it, and then now it's it's only measuring from this point, and then you can reset again, and now it's only measuring from this point. Uh, it's kind of like that. Um, so you can use a defined time range. An observer is a point in time um, measurement. Um, it's always instant. Um, it's not like a counter where you actively, um, you know, increment it in your code. Uh, a an observer is measuring something that it can only it can only measure at that instant, kind of like a fuel gauge. <laughs> um, synchronous measurements. Um, so this is this is back to uh, what I just said. So um, synchronous instruments are. Uh, invoke together with the operations they're measuring. Uh, they're measuring. So if you want to to measure the number of requests, um, you would every time you handle a new request, you'd uh, increment the counter. So that's synchronous because you're invoking it together with the thing it's it's measuring. So an example of writing a counter in Open telemetry using the Python um, library. Uh, you create a counter um, from the meter. You give it a name. You give it a description. There's a bunch more options. I'm simplifying. Um, and you can add. Uh, you can also give context to like adding. So if, if you were like counting the number of items, but you had different types of items. You could say, I'm adding, you know, a foo here. I, I just stripped that out. Um, so an example of counter, you know, number of requests, bytes, read or written, it only goes up. There are also bidirectional counters. Um, so you can subtract from them. That's the only difference. And an example of that would be the number of active connections. So as as connections are opened and closed, um, you would add and subtract connections so it can go up and down, but it's still synchronous. Histogram. Uh, so histograms are a little bit different. So you you record new values, <coughs> and uh, the the specifics of how that works in the background are, are kind of fuzzy. I won't try and explain it now. Uh, but also, again, um, you can you can attach context to um, whatever you're recording or incrementing. An example here is request duration. Um, so histograms, um, the, the actual instrument of a histogram can be represented in a bunch of different ways in certain, you know, um, uh, visualization backends um, or front end. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> so you could represent it as a list of, you know, P95, P99, P99.9, you know, um, latencies, or you could represent it as a heat map, or you could represent it as a histogram. And I think there's others. Um, but that's that's the idea. Uh, asynchronous instruments, um, also called observers, um, invoke a callback function on demand to collect measurements. Um, so for instance, uh, you would use an observer to periodically measure memory or CPU usage. Um, there's, there's nothing to instrument in your own code for this. This is something that has to be measured at a point in time. Um, so there's a thing called a gauge observer and there's a bunch of others that I didn't list here. Um, but basically you're, you're measuring a value on demand. Um, 
and you use a gauge for non-additive values for which a sum doesn't produce a meaningful correct result, uh, like resource utilization. Um, you know, if you have different services, 80% uh, utilization on one plus 15% utilization on another is not necessarily meaningful. That sum isn't necessarily meaningful. Um, it isn't always in any case. Um, or or error rate percentage. Um, if you have you know different, if you have a load balancer, a you know a uh, a, a two percent error rate on one instance plus a one percent error rate on another instance is not three percent necessarily. Um, you, you can't add it like that. It's not valid. Um, uh, a collection. Uh, so it's a collection. So uh, metrics are automatically collected in, by open telemetry in process, aggregated and exported. Um, so unlike logs, the cost of metrics doesn't increase in log step of the user traffic um, or any other system activity that could result in a sharp uptick, uptick in data uh, client. And, and because it can be aggregated in process, it, you're reducing traffic and and trying to avoid uh, more communication between services um, than necessary. Tracing. Um, so a span is a series of, sorry, a unit of work or an operation. Um, it tracks specific operations the request makes, painting a picture of what happened, during the time in which the operation was executed. Um, it contains things like a name, so a name of the span, time-related data, structured log messages, and other metadata um, called attributes um, to provide information about the operation it tracks. Uh, a trace basically records the progression of requests, so, sorry, the progression, progression of uh, individual requests made by an application or an end user as they propagate across different services and components. Um, that can include things like the database or data sources or queues and stuff like that. Um, it's, it's like a call stack for a distributed service. Um, so without tracing, it can be very challenging to pinpoint the cause of performance problems in the distributed system. Um, an attribute, so we want any and all data relevant to a span to be available um, so that when we're investigating these after the fact, we can draw conclusions from that. Um, Attributes or metadata that's attached to the span, such as uh, what user um, made this request, what is their shopping cart ID, what is their user agent, um, things like that. Um, you can imagine other examples. Daniel, would our yes. would our correlation ID be an attribute? Yes. Okay. So <laughs> okay. So so, it's, I, so as an example of a of a span i have an incoming call to the api that says it's a, it's a repo sync let's say and it has a correlation id and the the response to that is to spin up an asynchronous task which I, i'm pretty sure we do this the task that was spun up has the same correlation id as the api call so the yes, api yes. call came in with it came in said on correlation id x there was a response that said, okay, I get, here's the task I spun up for you. That API call is now done. Sometime later, that task is running with that correlation ID, does all of its stuff and says it's complete. And that that whole sequence is a span. Even though the task happens, who knows when, that's that's a span. Does that track? It's yeah. a span. Yes, exactly. So it's it's a trace. I would say it's it's trace. actually a trace. trace. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, each trace is a span, oh. but um from looking at the documentation, Daniel, just now for open telemetry, it seems like 
for each span that you want to define, you basically add some code around your code to designate it as a span. Yes. Um, and then that correlation ID, we could do this for tasks, for example. Yes. Where we define every task is a span, and when we then we can attach that correlation ID to that span from the task. Yes. Um, so so correlation ID is 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 kind of a it's kind of well, it's kind of a weak version of yes. what I'm describing. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. Cool. Um, Very cool. Yeah. So uh, a, cor a correlation ID, again, you're you're really just correlating it from the logs. So you have to you have to go back and reconstruct that correlation. But a trace is uh, it remains structured from um, beginning to end. Mm -hmm. Um and and when you view it in a in a trace viewer, um, it's it's still structured. Nice. <laughs> and and in fact, um, uh, log messages um, are correlated uh, are uh, are correlated directly to the the span in which the log message occurred. So I'll, I'll actually show an example of that later. Nice. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, once we create a span within our application, the exporter handles sending the data to our backend, um, whether that's in memory or or Jaeger or console output. Um, like I said, it's pluggable. Um, okay, demo. Um, can you can, uh, can you read this? Is this readable? Should I if assume? You, if you could um, uh, bigify that just a bit. Um, PyCharm also has a presentation view mode. Oh, uh, well, I'm using Sublime Text. OK. okay. That's good. That's, a, that's good. It, it probably does, that. too, but there's not enough UI to make it worth it. Um, <clears throat> OK. So this is a Flask gap. Sorry. Um, it's that's easier fine. to have everything on one page. Um, and, uh, so you can see this is just normal flask stuff. Mm -hmm. We have a little bit of instrumentation, not even very much. Um, so basically you, you instrument the app with the flask instrumenter from open telemetry. Uh, you set a tracer provider, um, and define a service name, and there's some other options. Um, you create a tracer. You create a Jaeger exporter. You add the span processor to the tracer. And that's kind of it. So basically, what you'll get with this is Every API call um, will create its own span by default because um, because instrumentation just adds that by default, um, which makes sense. You need a top level span for any operation, and um, and so if, if if you just have some simple code in request, all that um, that entire handler. Um, uh, would be the span would be the uh, you know um, so I have a simple a simple um, service here or a simple route um, just called hello all it does is it gets uh, a get parameter and then prints hello you know name um, there's a second one here um, called wait and it does something a little bit more complicated. So it, it calculates a random amount of time um, less than 0.2 seconds. And it will uh, wait for that amount of time. Um, so here, uh, I'm getting the span. I'm adding some, I'm adding an event to that span. Uh, it's basically a log message that says, I'm going to sleep for this number of seconds. 
I sleep. Uh, another event, I finish sleeping for, you know, that number of seconds. And then I have some more spans here. Uh, I'm going to sleep again. Another span, I'm going to sleep again. Um, and then I'm going to return this message, um, which, of course, is not the amount of time that I actually slept, but ignore that. Um, three. There we go. Um, I also here have a client. So this is just um, some Python code that uses requests to send a request uh, to my service. There's nothing special here, really. Um, all it's doing is sending you know, the argument I provide to the script um, to the service. And there's the same kind of thing over here. Um, note that I've used the same service name. That's relevant. On the service name on the on client. The client. As, I've, I've, instrumented on the, the, I've instrumented the client with the same service name. Um, and, you know, uh, I've, you know, creating a span here named client and, and making the request and, and, and all that's pretty straightforward. All it's doing is sending a request with the request library. So both the server and the client are being, uh, monitored. In this case, what I've done here is instrument both the server and the client. Yeah. Yes. It makes sense that it, it's multi-service. Um, architecture. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. Any questions about any of that? So far, so good. Okay. All right. <laughs> Apologies. All right. So I've just sent the request with my client.py. Um, what was the, did someone disconnect or something? There's just somebody, no, somebody coming in. You're good. Keep okay. going. Cool. Um, so I've just sent the request. Uh, you can see it over here. You know, hello, hello. It's probably not the best name, but okay. Um, so what I have here is Jaeger. Um, Jaeger is a way of viewing uh, traces. And over here, you can see I've picked the Hello World service, uh, which is the one I use for both the client and the server. Um, so if I click Find Traces, um, now it shows up. I can look at uh, basically the history of the operation. Uh, you can see here, client shows up. So for the so the client uh, the client request response cycle took six point seven five milliseconds, and you can see here also the server and the server took two point one milliseconds to uh, return the response, and you can see you know the start time and duration and all of that stuff. Um, you can see alongside um, alongside this, uh, you know, the status code of the request, the uh, the scheme, the route, the method, you know, the host, you know, the IP address, um, the library that instrumented it, and all that stuff, uh, SDK version, you know, all that stuff. So that's tagged to this span, all right? Um, and, and the same sort of thing with the client. So that's cool. And if I make some more requests, whoops. 
uh, you will see them showing up. And you can see they're even charted by how long they took. Um, this is interesting. I wonder why that one is charted over here. Oh wait, no. So this was so this the 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 bottom axis here is over time. Um, so you know, ten, ten, nineteen, and ten seconds. So this this is showing you. Um, when the requests were made, and this is the duration, the vertical axis is the duration. Oops. Um, so that was our simple hello endpoint. Um, there's not there's not much to really demonstrate there, but let's take a look at wait. Um, this tool that you're using for visualization is it a push or a pull model? Um, I'm, I'm not even sure. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm going to call, Peter. yeah, so I'm going to call our wait endpoint a couple of times, right? So you can see, um, you know, we're printing our message. Uh, they're all different. It's, it's, they're all sleeping for different amounts of time. Give it a few more. All right, so let's refresh. And now we can see uh, our, our, hello, our hello world response times were quaint. Um, you can now see, you know, these, this is taking 400 milliseconds. Um, so let's take a look at this one. Right, so we can see again. You know, it's tagged with, it's tagged with all this data, but we can also see here um, the logs that were associated with this span. And we can see our inner spans. Um, Hello world child and hello world inner child. <clears throat> and we can see how um, each of these spans took, you know, progressive amounts of time. And this whole thing together uh, had a duration of, you know, 457 milliseconds. You know, so this is request start time, zero, zero microseconds. Uh, it had a total duration of you know 457. Our next span had to start started at you know 152 milliseconds, which is roughly the same as our amount of time to sleep, um, and it lasted you know 303 because our inner span you know had a start time at 304 and then a, a duration at, at 151. And so we can visualize what happened at each step here. So Daniel. And, and that's the cool thing about tracing. Let me think, I'm, I'm just gonna think out loud about a specific example in Pulp. Um, if I had a trace called sync, um, then the whole sync would be A span, but you could also have each stage in that sync pipeline be its own span, its own child span, if you will. And then if I were using this kind of visualization, what I would see is, well, the sync took this long, and then I would see the hierarchy of the stages. Well, like we did this stage and this stage and this stage, and this is how long each of them took. Mm -hmm. is that, would that work out? Is that how this all works? Well, the stages run in parallel. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Concurrency That's makes that hard. It's fair, it's fair. Yeah. I think it would still be worth doing, but you're right. I'd forgotten about the fact that the stages well, are the whole, are the whole task. Work. But yeah, having something around all the tasks, like a span for every task, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Interesting. Okay, I'll have to think about this. Yeah. Visualization is always the hard part, right? Yeah, and there's some other there's some other interesting things you can see with Jaeger. So, like, you know, you can see it's it's it constructed a model of 
our whole service hierarchy per se from the number, you know, from the requests that we made. Um, I guess you have to set this up specifically. You can compare traces. I won't do that. But um, I think you get the idea. Uh, this is pretty cool. Yes, it is. All right. Yeah, thank um, you for sharing this with us. Yeah, and that's that's all I have. So if you have any questions, let me know. And oh, okay. And so uh, one more thing. So what I didn't get to, um, which based on time, um, it's probably completely fine. Um, uh, you can you know set this up with Kubernetes. It works well together. I'm pretty sure you can auto scale based on metrics, but I didn't get enough. I didn't have enough time to research that. Um, I didn't actually show any live metrics with the in the code um, because you have to set some more stuff up, and uh, I didn't really go that deep into tracing. Um, but um, there's a lot here. Like it, it's pretty deep. Um, it's very flexible. You can do a lot, um, and it's cool. All right, so questions. <laughs> yeah, I have a, I mean, a question, but really, it's it's a statement. Um, the question would be, where do we go from here? And I think what I would say, say is, um, so I think in terms of pulp as a project. Um, growth and history, this is super appropriate. I think it's really one of the best ways that we can spend time to create value for our users. Um, and so how do we, like, where do we go from here? I think either forming a working group or having, um, you know, some small number of people who are very interested in, the, in this, which would kind of be like an informal working group, start to work on something. Um, and having some way to, the working group model has worked really, really well for us, I think. So that would work like meet maybe every two weeks, start it, uh, make, put out a call for it on discourse, um, have people identify they wanna be a part of the working group. That's kind of like the process. Um, I think that would be really great because that I believe would, would really take this and move it forward. And my worry is that we won't organize around this, and that's real, and that would be a missed opportunity to me. Yeah, that all sounds really good to me. We already have one issue related to metrics, so that would be a good starting point. Yep. Definitely. Yeah, I feel like Ina makes a really good point. <laughs> we have like a real use case that we want to um, uh, start mm, collecting metrics on. Yeah, and specifically like the auto scaling based on metrics. I didn't. I didn't have enough time to research that, so I, I can't even really answer questions about it. But I'm pretty sure it's something that's, you can do. Yep. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I, I mean, that's what uh, why this project and Kubernetes. Uh, Play so well together yep. <laughs> because yeah. that's the you know natural relationship the, yeah the value that kubernetes offers you is that hey you can set up um scaling based on metrics if those metrics are available yeah kubernetes also does a great job of taking one thing and making it like a hundred things so yep. i think <laughs> kubernetes really needs uh stuff like this in order yeah. to kind of get it back into the um, bring it back to a cognitive load that a human can understand. Yeah. And exactly. so what one problem we actually ran into that I thought was rather interesting. I don't know if you guys have thought about it, but uh, so we use Kubernetes and the problem we have is that we're trying to scale up workers based on the task queue. Uh, because originally we were doing CPU and memory, but that doesn't make sense, right? Because the worker might not be using that many resources. But instead, we want to scale up based on a task queue. So I don't know if there's an issue for that or what have you, but maybe I can file That one. is exactly the issue that we're discussing. That's yep. the very first use case we want to handle. Oh, OK. Yep. Well, it seems and like it, you know, David already implemented it. 
Yeah, there we go. David, well, can you give us a PR? We're, we're, we're ready. Um, and of course, it's more complicated than just that, right? You, it's like, oh, we need to we need to spin up more workers because of the queue, the waiting queue is getting too big or we're always at max workers. Clearly, we need more. But then you run into things like well, you keep spinning up more workers and things get worse. Well, it's because the bottlenecks is actually the database and your database node is getting completely overwhelmed and having more workers running is not helping. So it's complicated, but tools like this will give us and give administrators a view to being able to handle that complication. I'm in, by the way, whenever we, um, <laughs> whatever we want to do here, um, because this is, I agree with Brian, this is, this is the next step in making pulp truly production ready is giving admins insight into the internals of what's going on in their installations. It's the next thing we need to do. Is someone able to take an action, <laughs> an action item for um, filing Forming. the discourse? Discourse for what? <clears throat> for the work I group? Yeah, basically. I, I hear Daniel. No, well, okay, Daniel. If you want, to do it, if Daniel, if you want to do it, go ahead and do it. But right now, you have a lot on your plate. Um, if you don't want to do it, I'll take the action item to start a thread on discourse and open up the. I don't know whether we call, want to call it a SIG or a working group or whatever we want to call it, and then we'll see what we come up with after a couple of meetings. How about um, I'll take the action item to either either file the thread myself or delegate it if I can. Perfect. Sounds, Sounds good. good. Either Sounds way, good. it's gonna get done. Yes. Awesome. Man, I'm so excited about this. Yes. Um, this is gonna be awesome. <laughs> yeah, between it between this and the pie test work, I am I'm I, I are very excited. <laughs> and and going back to this slide real quick, um, so the very first thing they added um when um when they were trying to, you know, un unscrew uh, healthcare.gov uh, was was monitoring open telemetry didn't exist at the time so it wasn't this but similar the same concept outstanding the very first thing they added like week one hey i just realized i'm sorry all i have not been paying attention to time we are a little over time right now um brian you are uh, the last talk and then we move into open discussion are you okay with a with a short delay for people to take a quick break and then we'll start your talk at let's see it's 33 past you want to start